Tim Roberts also gives this talk with me, but unfortunately he had to cancel last minute for a family emergency, so he apologized for that. So I will try to do his, uh, his red team stories justice, and if not, then he's not here to know otherwise. So, um, so the talk, security guards, LOL, uh, what Tim and I do, we do uh, social, social engineering, red team assessments, things like that. And so we've we've realized that basically every time we go and do one of these types of assessments, we run into security guards. And so we've, over the years, we sort of collected all these, these stories that we've basically uh, used the security guard in our favor to give us access to locked rooms and things like that. So we're going to, uh, well, I'm going to share some of those stories with you and, and some of the techniques that we used uh, to sort of show the flaw with having your entire physical uh, physical security resting on the hands of one, maybe two security guards that sometimes don't really care. So, uh, all right. So, who am I? I'm Brent White. I uh, work with NTT Security. And then, um, of course, you know, don't want to put too much emphasis on who I am because that's not really important. What's important are the flaws that we're going to talk about today. So, and as you can see, I'm very serious and immature. So, um, primary goal of the assessment. So before you can go in and just start seeing what you can do with buildings and what you can get into, you have to have permission from the client. That's very important unless you plan on getting arrested. So uh, during the kickoff call, you discuss things like, okay, what's the point? What, what are we coming in to do? Is it to get into server room? Is it to get into files? You know, maybe some uh, secret files or something like that, that would be awful if unauthorized users were to get them. Um, what can we do if we get into a server room? Can we take something out? You know, so if there's a, a server you know, that's not being used, just sitting on the floor, can we carry it out of the building? Can we take laptops, things like that? Uh, can we take files that we might find? So um, those are all things that you want to you know, discuss with the client so that if you do take something out, it's not, uh, you know, not going to upset them because maybe it's some sort of classified information or something that should not be outside of a certain room. Um, start and stop time and date, that seems pretty obvious, but uh, we've had issues where uh, the client wasn't necessarily maybe not paying attention or this wasn't discussed, and so one of our assessors thought, okay, we're starting Sunday, but they weren't expecting us until Monday or Tuesday. Uh, they get a call that something's going on, freak out, call the police, and, you know, things escalate from there. Uh, so you want to make sure that everyone understands when this is happening. Uh, can you test? Can you do uh, physical entry, social engineering after hours? Or do they only want this stuff, you know, during business hours? Um, and of course, your legal documentation. Uh, something that Tim and I like to do. Uh, so if, if someone approaches you and they say, what are you doing here, and you're caught and you can't get out of it, then uh, you give them the letter of authorization or what we call the get out of jail free card. Uh, and that basically says, you know, this is a, here is who you should call. Uh, here's the authorization that these guys are okay to do this. And then hopefully they'll follow their, you know, procedures and, uh, and then you go about your business. So something that we like to use is we like to give a fake letter of authorization. Um, this is to see if they're actually going to, t you know, what their response is. Like, okay, they're just going to scan this and uh, like, okay, this is, you know, whatever, go ahead, go about your business. And it was fake. And I'll show you an example, one of our letters that actually has the address of the White House and uh, ri just ridiculous information that way if they actually take the time to read that letter, they're going to know something's up. Uh, a risk with that is if they read the letter, they're going to know something's up. So if you try to give them a second letter at that point, you're going to have a lot more trouble at that time. Um, but I'll get into, I'll discuss some ways to sort of de-escalate those situations in a bit. So once you figure out, okay, why are we here? What are we doing? When do we do it? What are the rules? Then uh, in everything is signed. Um, not just verbal agreements, just a little tip there, uh, then you're good to go. So 
Yeah, I have some really stupid images on this thing. So, uh, incident response is that part of it. So, what does this mean? So, when we go in there, we're doing our covert assessment. Uh, we eventually, if we're going and we're just kind of having our way in this building and no one's saying anything, how ridiculous do we have to get before someone will come and stop us and say, you know, what are you doing here? So, uh, or is it not part of it? If that's the case, then we try to stay covert the entire time. Um, so again, I was talking about the letter. So with this, are they actually following their policies or just taking your word for it? That's the whole fake letter. So if you give them that, are they escalating it to the right people or are they saying, okay, cool, you know, go ahead. So uh, something that, a funny story of Tim's is that he was on site. He had a security guard catch him while he was picking a lock, trying to get in the side building. And the guard comes over and goes, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, you know, just uh, working on the lock. And he, long story short, uh, Tim gives this guy the fake letter. It had my phone number on it, you know, as the CIO of the company, uh, which obviously is not, you know, legitimate. And so uh, they start talking, and the security guard's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. You know, I'm in security, too. And Tim's like, yeah, you are. So they had, you know, it was, yeah, it was. And so the guy was all excited, and Tim was like, uh, so could you, you know, I'm going to be here for a few days. Um, you know, would you mind telling the other security guards, too? That way, you know, I can just keep doing my thing. And he was like, oh, yeah, sure. So he, uh, he, he's like, yeah, I'll go tell him right now. So he told the security guards. And he walked around. He didn't even have to try to be covert. And he had the, the place to himself the whole week off of a fake letter of authorization just because they, ha they built that, that trust, you know, both being in, you know, security. So, um, and that, that shows, uh, you know, I guess some poor incident response. So you always want to make sure, is that part of the assessment? Uh, and by the way, during, during this, uh, if anybody has any questions, anything I'm saying, like, uh, technique or if I didn't explain something properly, I highly encourage questions or feedback or and if you want to throw money and stuff too, that's cool. So, do you have a question? So, when, when you're initially engaging with the customer, do you tell them who can be going on site and do they know that it's them or do they know that it's somebody who wants to use the Somebody, because, uh, and that, I'm glad you asked that because we have had instances where they knew so, so you have the client that uh, was on the phone call. Okay, this is going to happen. It's the person that, we want you guys to come do this for us. And we're like, okay, that's cool. So this is uh, when we will send someone out. And uh, it was someone that had been there for a previous, thing. it was like a wireless assessment or something. And so they, had, they already knew each other. Uh, and so as soon as the consultant got on site, this guy that hired them to come do this immediately like was walking around looking for him and said okay gotcha you're done and so it's like so you want to obviously avoid that because that's not a realistic you know uh, assessment of their security posture so it's always good to sort of leave it a bit anonymous if possible you know when you're doing those type of assessments so so here uh, this is one of Tim's uh, so I'm going to read some of this, and then I'll, once I read it, then I'll kind of go into more details. So uh, he was a corporate employee, and he was able to convince the security guard to open a biometric authenticated server room and gain the access codes to the security systems, uh, and he was granted unescorted access to the data center. So um, he was, he got into this building, he was approached, uh, you know, he saw some names in the parking lot, and then through OSINT before starting, he learned names of, of the important people there. So a lady approached him, excuse me, uh, what are you doing here? Oh, well, I'm here, uh, I have an interview with so-and-so. And, -so. and um, she was like, oh, well, that's, that's in the other building. And he was like, oh, I'm really sorry. Uh, and she was like, so are you new? Uh, and he was like, yeah, you know, they gave me the job and everything, and uh, I was just coming to follow up and do paperwork and stuff. But, um, but I think his room's in there, and she and the lady was kind of new as well. And she's like, "Oh, okay. Well, then you need to see this systems person. His office is, you know, this way, which was inside of their secure area, 
that was, you know, being watched by an armed guard. So uh, she was like, okay, so uh, go ahead and badge in. And he's like, well, I'll try. And she's like, well, you're new. Uh, your badge probably doesn't work yet. So, of course, he tries his badge, which was a total blank badge. There's nothing written to it, and it didn't work. And he was like, yeah, you're right. It doesn't work yet. And so she was like, oh, okay, well, I can try. And so uh, she tries, and she's not authorized to get into this area. And so by this time, uh, her and Tim and the armed security guard had been talking, you know, just about things locally and kind of built a, some rapport. And so the security guard's like, oh, it's okay, I'll let you in. So he comes, badges them in, uh, and lets them go into the secure area, two people that didn't have authorization to be there. So as he's in there, uh, and something I forgot to mention too, at the beginning of uh, the assessment, this client was like, okay, you know, good luck. You know, you guys aren't going to get anything and just wasn't being, you know, very friendly. And, uh, and so Tim didn't really appreciate that. So, you know, he was like, okay, well, we'll see, you know. So, um, so he goes through there, he gets in, uh, and he sets up. Once the lady gets in, he's like, okay, I can, I can wait for him right here. You don't have to wait for me. And she's like, okay, well, you know, it's nice to meet you. I'll see you around. Leaves him there, uh, plugs in a, a rogue access point, which later in the evening he's able to reach from his hotel room. And so, uh, so he's in there, and then he's able to get into the main guy's office, the one that said, you know, good luck, you know, we're awesome, you guys aren't going to get anything. Lays his business card on the desk and <laughs> walks out. <coughs> so, uh, long story short, the incident response was obviously not there. Uh, they didn't follow through with things, and Tim was able to build rapport, you know, with, uh, you know, Ham New. He knew some names. He name dropped and just, you know, was being very confident with his presentation, which confidence goes a long way. I mean, you really can just BS about anything, and as long as you act like you know what you're talking about, people are, they will take that at face value and be like, oh, well, he looks like he knows what he's talking about. So um, those are, that's, that's a big thing that we use all the time. So if you're walking through a building that you're not supposed to be and you're kind of, you know, shy, like looking around like you're lost, people are going to see, like, what's this guy doing here? He's obviously lost. But if you walk through there like you own the place, you know, or you, you know, look like you're a little upset or something, it, it's a huge uh, deterrent to getting people to be like, excuse me, sir, you know. Um, so anyway, um, so he had a fake badge. Uh, so he, when he was on site looking around, I looked at what people were wearing, went back to his hotel, uh, created that, printed it out, and then stuck it in the sleeve on front of the, the badge, the RFID badge, and then just walked around with that. Uh, he said people just kind of glanced at that and didn't ask questions, which is how one of the reasons he was able to get so deep into the building where he was outside of the server room. So, um, and then at that point, while he was in there again, he, you know, picked the lock to the office of the guy that said, you know, good luck. And uh, so uh, Tim was pretty happy about that motivation. He used it well. And then he also uh, picked locks to get into shredder bins to also obtain more uh, sensitive information that had not been shredded yet, so. Um, okay, so I'm here from IT security. So this is one of the um, one of my stories. So this client, um, large client, and they had uh, three locations. So the first location, it was in a, a shared building, and my hotel was right across the street. Uh, did some OSINT. Couldn't find any pictures of their badges or anything online. Which try that. You'll be surprised how many people. You know, you'll, they'll be at a uh, like a, a work outing or a barbecue or something with their buddies and they've got their badges, you know, hanging. And so you just zoom in and look at that and usually get a pretty decent idea to uh, forge, you know, your, your badge. So uh, I sat at this little cafe where they were all having breakfast. I got there about as early as I could. So they were coming in and having breakfast and I was able to look at it. And there were uh, two ladies at the table right next to me and I was on my laptop and so her badge was hanging on her purse. So as I'm sitting there, 
uh, drinking coffee, I'm looking at her badge, and right next to her, I'm duplicating it as best I can on Photoshop. So luckily, she didn't look over at my screen like, what are you doing? So um, finished breakfast, went over to the hotel, uh, printed it off, and I got some odd looks from the front desk when I asked for uh, scissors and tape and was cutting it out like in front of them so I could hand it back to them. And they're like, well, you know, that's interesting. I was like, yeah, I'm a graphic designer. And they're like, okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you can just really just come up with any reason and say it with confidence. But, oh, he's a graphic designer. Why else would he be making a, you know, a badge for the company next door on paper? So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so it sounds silly, and sometimes uh, there's a guy that, that we know that he made a badge, he just cut out paper and got a red crayon and scribbled on it and was able to walk down the tarmac of an airport, which is supposed to be secure, but he's walking with the badge with the red crayon scribbled on it, and that was it. But, you know, people just look for the badge hanging there, and like, oh, he has something there, it must be a real badge. I don't need to bother that guy. So, um, so anyway, I, uh, I, go, I create the badge, and I come back, and um, I walk in, and I, that's when I realize, okay, this isn't their entire building. They have one level, one section, and it's a suite. So when you walk into their lobby, they have two doors. One was a locked uh, meeting door, when there was a meeting going on, and so they could see me, and the other door was into the offices, and the only way you could get in was by badging in or ringing the doorbell. So I was like, all right, you know, let's see how this goes. So uh, I rang the doorbell, lady comes over, and I show her, it's kind of glance, and I'm like, hey, I'm Ken Adams from uh, IT, I'm here to do some system upgrades. Does anybody watch Friends, the show Friends? He's like Ken Adams. Anyway, yeah, love that show. So I'm Ken Adams, and then Tim is always the uh, Elliot Alder. What's the from Mr. Robot? That's the name he always puts on his uh, his thing. And sometimes we'll use images. Uh, he used an image of John Travolta instead of his own picture. And then and so we'll we'll do all these crazy things just to see if people are paying attention. So I showed her my badge. I'm Ken Adams from uh, IT. I'm here to do uh, some system upgrades and take inventory. And she was like, okay, who did you say? And I was like, Ken Adams from IT. I'm here to do system upgrades, you know, kind of being a jerk just to kind of make her feel uncomfortable, which you feel bad about because they're super nice people, and here you are, you know, lying to them, which is awful to say. But, I mean, that's some, you got to do that because people that are doing something malicious, they don't care if they're going to hurt your feelings, right? So, um so she's like, oh, okay. And I was like, yeah, I just started. I, I was like, do you know where the server room is? Like, I haven't been to this location. She's like, well, I just started too. So I was like, yes. <laughs> so, um, so we walk. She's like, I think it's back there in that closet. And I was like, okay, yeah, they said something about a, a closet when they told me to come up here. So she's like, okay. And so she unlocks the door. And it was just a smaller, you know, it, it was like uh, two or three racks. And so she opens up. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I need. I just, and so I got a, a notepad, and I was like, yeah, I just got to write down these serial numbers. This is probably going to take me a while, so if you want, I can just come get you when I'm done. She's like, oh, okay, I sit over there. So uh, three hours and about 50, uh, 50 uh, hashes later, because uh, I'd, I'd plugged in straight to the thing I was running, responder for the, uh, the LLMNR poisoning. And so I uh, grabbed several hashes, you know, got some sensitive stuff off the network, and, um, and I think uh, I, I wrote down like five or six numbers, you know, on a page just so I could like show it, like, yeah, I'm done now. So she's like, okay, cool, thanks. And I was like, should I lock the door back? Oh, yeah, and uh, Land Turtle was plugged into, um, which was fun later. So I uh, went to her. I was like, yeah, I'm done uh, in that room. I was like, I still need to take inventory um, I was like, where is your manager's office? And she's like, oh, it's back here, but she's out on vacation. And I was like, yeah, that's, they said that she might not be in, you know, just kind of like reaffirming whatever she tells me. And so she's like, okay, I can let you in there. I was like, great. So, so not only does she unlock the door and let me in to those, but every single office 
that was locked. She just let me in and let me do whatever. And again, you know, most of the time, physical access, it's game over, right? So, um, so I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, when I was, as I was leaving, um, she's like, yeah, um, and can you tell them that uh, we're having a problem with the thick client and the meeting room? I was like, yeah, ready notes, absolutely, I'll let them know. So I was like, is there anything else? And she was like, well, my computer's running slow. And I was like, okay, let me see it, you know. <laughs> so un unlocked machine, sat down at it, did my thing. Uh, yeah, I, and so and I felt so bad because she was like, yeah, I just started and, and uh, it's a really nice place to work, but you know, sometimes, and you're just going on and on. It's like, yeah, I know what you mean. And I feel, and then the whole time I'm thinking, man, I, uh, I feel horrible because she's super nice. She just started, and I have to put her name in this report. So, uh, and as a side note, something that we like to do during the kickoff call is we like to specifically request please do not terminate anyone that we might leverage for any sort of attack. Because we've, we've had issues in the past where uh, security guards were replaced or whatever because we have been able to get them to completely give us their set of master keys and go where we needed to go and come back, things like that. So we always say, you know, please don't terminate them. Let us use this as a teaching moment because we guarantee they'll never do this again once they get called out. So why get rid of them and then bring someone else in that has to learn the whole thing all over again? So, um, so anybody in here that's, that does pen testing or you know red team stuff like that, you know that's a, a that's a good thing to add in your kickoff call because you know you don't want anybody to lose their job over that, right? So, um, so uh, yeah, so I went through the, the all the all the offices, got everything in, left. And uh, so I had to call the client right away and escalate. I'm like, hey, I did this. I got all this information. Uh, basically, you know, owned your entire network in, you know, just a couple hours. Uh, so I was on the way to their bigger location. And she's like, oh, okay. Um, well, that's, that sounds really good. And you can tell she wasn't too thrilled about it. So... Uh, when I pull up to this very, very large complex, it's an uh, industrial park with several buildings and a long road that everyone shared to a gigantic parking lot. It was lunchtime. There were a lot of cars in and out. Long story short, as soon as I get out and walk, walk up to go start this thing, I had picked the lock to a door, but it was like an a HVAC room, external HVAC room, the only way I was getting inside the building is if I was crawling through a tunnel and or like a, a air duct, and I was not doing that. So, as soon as I closed that, security security guard comes outside. Hey, you didn't even give me a chance to explain anything. It was like, hey man, you know, here's my letter. He was like, you're coming with me. And so, uh, we had talked a little bit, and he ended up telling me that he received a phone call, and he watched me drive all the way to the parking lot. And uh, so he he was tipped off. So that was that was unfortunate. So you'll have things like that. Sometimes you'll have those situations where, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the client that seeked out, you know, our coworker immediately. Sometimes, you know, you'll have sort of a unfair situation like that. There's really nothing you can do but comply. So you're not, you know, being tackled to the ground. Um, and we do also put language in our agreements that uh, the client will go to all measures necessary, all means necessary to ensure that uh, local and federal authorities are not contacted, which is great because being handcuffed and waiting for hours and hours for someone to finally say, yeah, he's supposed to be there is, uh, I imagine, a horrible day. So, yeah, billable, <laughs> yeah, I like the way you think, billable hours, that is awesome. Uh, I've had the opportunity, but no, because I, uh, I made sure to find another way because that doesn't seem fun. Because a lot of times when we go in, you know, you're usually wearing, uh, you know, a, a suit. You know, you don't, you know, go out tie and all that. But, you know, a suit to make it look like you at least have something of reason of importance to be there. 
So I don't want to crawl through HVAC in a tailored suit. That's, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, let me get. There are some cases where we can find those online, uh, and that's a great point. So uh, open source intelligence, OSINT, uh, if anyone's not familiar with that, that's basically any sort of intelligence that you can use uh, through freely available sources, you know, Google, uh, there's several other tools that are freely available, um, and I'm more than happy to tell you specific tools that I use after after the talk if you are interested. But yes, always look, uh, Google Maps is great because it gives you an idea of the layout of the property. Um, if you can find images, sometimes it will help you f figure out where the entrances are, that way you're not having to you know, try to drive around or walk around the building and someone say, hey, why are you out here just walking around our building? Um, which there are ways around that, you know, I'm just out here on my lunch break killing some time, is that okay? Uh, so blueprints, if you can find them, are great. Again, if you can find pictures of badges online, uh, names of employees, email addresses, um, and there have even been times where, uh, excuse me, where I have found developers that went on help forums. Hey, I'm having a hard time getting this uh, SQL database to run these queries. Okay, I'll help. And so like, all right, I'll set you up a temporary user. Here's the login and stuff. And this is like three, four years ago, and they never disabled those. So then you're like, okay, thank you for the access. And uh, so that's, that's a whole different issue there. But take the time to do your research before you go. Uh, and, and another, even playing deeper into that, let's say you, uh, you know who the security guard is or the security guard company that's local, then you can learn about maybe the person that owns it or an event that happened recently. And you go in and say, you know, uh, hey, man, how's it going? I heard you guys, you know, had that issue with that employee last week. Uh, we were sent over to look at that. I'm really sorry about that. And then they start telling you all about it. And then when you're done talking, you just walk right by them. So, you know, look for anything you can to make it look like you are familiar, you're familiar with that company or whatever they do. Um, something else, I'm kind of getting off track a little bit, but this, I don't know, like this is important. Learn the lingo of whatever the client does. So if it's a design firm, learn uh, some lingo about design, you know, whatever it might be if it's financial or whatever, do a little bit of, you don't have to be an expert, but you, you don't want to go on there and, you know, sound like an idiot. So you want to be able to go, if you're cornered, you're, you're at lunch with an employee or something, just some small talk, and then now you're a familiar face to them. So if you are trying to get in the door and they see you, you're like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. They'll, you know, let you in, or they won't bother you while you're walking around. So those are all things that can pay off. Just... Uh, do your research, know what you're going into, and get some more info. Um, okay, two questions. First, how, what's your strategy for learning the lingo? How do you, how do you go about that? So, that's a good question, too. So, let's say, um, let's say it's financial, okay? So, you obviously want to figure out, okay, what's, uh, what are some trends in the stock market lately? What are people concerned about? You know, with the new, new president in, how is that affecting things? You know, just kind of, just anything that you could think would be just simple, small talk. You don't have to, you know, open a portfolio and, you know, like, oh, yeah, uh, I can't go to this client yet because I haven't been trading stocks for years or anything like that. But uh, another way, if, if you're able to, is become a client of that client. So if they sell, you know, healthcare or whatever, see if you can open in some sort of an account with them just to show interest, because uh, then you have credentials for their web app. Uh, you learn who to talk to for, you know, uh, customer assistance, things like that. Plus, you learn their specific terms. So if they have, like, their own little uh, generic terms that they use for products and things, you're familiar with that because you have uh, become a customer. Now, that, that's not always something you can do, but again, uh, just do some research and, and see if that's a possibility. Um, and one more question yeah. is, how often do you find yourself in the back of the squad car? Zero. Really? 
Yeah, zero. No, nope. not yet. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Right. But it becomes obvious, you know, sending out, you're doing a phishing campaign, and uh, right before you do it, you're like, okay, what's going on? Why have only two people clicked this and no one filled out the form? But you do a very similar campaign, and you get, you know, 20 or 30 interpreter cells in an hour. And then you find out that something like that happened. And so when you when you are positive and you have enough information where you can, you know, be on a shadow of a doubt, you know, that we were just kind of sabotaged, then what we will do, uh, for example, we had a, a client that wanted us to do uh, remote phishing, you know, which is like uh, phishing, vishing, all the other uh, ways to pronounce that word. So um, they said, okay, you are not allowed to use our company logo on anything. You are not allowed to pose as an employee. You are not allowed to pose as a contractor. Okay, so yeah, let's do some cold calls. You know, uh, hi, would you like to buy some magazines? Like, no. And, uh, so what do you do with that? Um, and so we do mention, um, we feel like limited due to these restrictions, and then we'll... Uh, we will list those, but you have to be very careful about that because it is your client. They are paying you, uh, and you can, you know, we'll say like, well, we urge you to not place these restrictions or whatever because attackers aren't going to have those restrictions. They will use these me methods, and they are very successful methods, so you need to uh, have a realistic I guess, view of what your employees might do in this situation. So we always advise and say, this is why we disagree. But ultimately, if they say, I don't care, don't do it anyway, I'm like, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, you know, thank you for being a customer, uh, which is fine. Um, but again, there are issues with that. So we mention what we can without, you know, like, well, you wouldn't let us do this, and, you know, this wasn't fair, and, you know, we're not coming back next. You know, you can't do that. So you just got to be careful how you word it. Yeah. Regarding forging like uh, badges and things, is there any like sort of particular materials you use, or is it just like you kind of like? Uh, for anybody that couldn't hear, he asked any specific materials that I use for forging badges. Um, if you're in a pinch and you don't have a badge printer or something with you, then yeah, just paper, hotel printer if you need to. Or like I said earlier, a crayon, you know, just depends on uh, the level of seriousness or how difficult it can be. Now, there are some uh, situations or there are some locations where it's very difficult to get in without a badge due to man traps and things like that. So you want your badge to look as legitimate as possible. A uh, co-worker of ours, Drew Culbertson, uh, had an assessment where it was basically a single point of entry. Everyone was, was sketchy of him the whole time. They basically uh, ended up interrogating him for a bit, and he still got out of it because he printed a badge that looked so legitimate with a uh, an actual printer on you know the uh, the plastic badge. So it looked like a real badge, and so even through this interrogation, they still were like, okay, he must be an employee. And this, I mean, so. How he got out of that, you know, is incredible. He did a very good job on that. So, again, it just depends on what resources you have and then, you know, what, how serious, I guess, uh, that's going to come in play. So, was, yeah. Yeah, uh, the... The person or the, the client that put all of those restrictions the previous year, uh, the report was not pretty. And uh, it was the same person. And so I imagine that they did that in a way to maybe protect 
their position or something. Could be more things going on, politics, things like that. But we do find that if there is a, a company that we go in and, I mean, we basically tear them apart. Uh, I hate to put it that way, but uh, the next year, all of a sudden, there's all these limitations and things. Uh, which, you know, from that point of view, is understandable. But um, real world attackers, again, don't have those limitations. Uh, they have, bless you, they have months and months that they could stake something out and do whatever, and we usually have a week, two weeks. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. We'll have a few. Uh, we usually, I think I took them out. I actually meant to bring all my tools and stuff, but I left them on my desk, and that's not of use here, but uh, we will have a few that we keep with us. Uh, Tim carries a clipboard around. It's a hollow clipboard, and you open it up, and inside of that is a badge cloner for different types of badges. And so I'll get to that story in a minute, but, uh, but we, we have devices that will... You know, trying to go and like, it was hanging out, and I've got the clipboard hanging by my side or something, and we're in line at lunch, I'll just standing real close, and we're like, oh, sorry, man. And then, you know, and then I go and print it to a badge. So uh, a lot of techniques like that that we can use. Um, and a way to mitigate that, too, is the RFID blocking uh, sleeves for badges. They have some that uh, prevent that, that way you take your card out and use it and then put it back in there. That way somebody can't, you know, grab your, your stuff. Uh, I know uh, DOD and military, they also have uh, their card holders that it's like a thick plastic. So when it's closed like this, it won't work. But when they go up to the badge reader, they just squeeze it open and it separates and then their badge works and then they just let go of it and it closes again. So th there are many options to protect against that. So... Um, Key RFID badges. So this is Tim's, and I get, apologize for having to read because you know he's so familiar with this that I kind of have to, uh, you know, go over it again. Let's see. Um, so he got into a facility, uh, got into several sensitive areas, plugged in malicious devices, uh, stole a bunch of one-day badges. So uh, this is one that that he and I were. There were three of us, and on these physical things, I always I recommend to always have at least two people. If you're going in alone, it's a lot harder uh, to do things because let's say if, if I'm about to get caught or if there's a security guard, I can go distract that security guard and maybe get caught on purpose. And if there's one security guard for an entire building with many entrances, which is often the case, their whole physical security program is being tied up because I'm there being a distraction. Um, and so he is usually off somewhere doing, doing something else. So uh, I highly recommend that. So basically, this is one where, uh, so we got in, and uh, he ended up hanging up, talking to the security guard, and uh, we were over there, and we're like, yeah, how's, you know, how's the weather uh, been? We're, you know, we're from out of town, but we're here doing whatever. So long story short, uh, they have a big folder of badges that they hand, you know, for like one day or uh, contractors and stuff like that. Um, after talking with them, I have a picture of Tim then sitting behind the desk with the security guard with his feet propped up looking at the binder because he was doing badge inventory. And so he's taking, uh, and <coughs> so he's taking these badges out. And the funniest thing is like, uh, so he has the badge, and he has his clipboard, and um, he's sitting there, and he'll take the badge, and he's like rubbing it on the clipboard, you know, and it's making a lot of noise, and it looks stupid. Why would you take out a badge and rub it on your clipboard? You know, and she's sitting there watching, and he's like, yeah, looks like you guys are, uh, you know, keeping up with these pretty well. Uh, yeah, I'm going to write down a few more numbers. Oh, and hey, uh, we were trying to get into the access control room, but uh, my key isn't working, and the lady down there said just to come get your key and uh, so we could get in there and do what we need. And she's like, and he's like, here, uh, here are my keys. I'll give them to you and come back. It was this set of bump keys, which are, you know, basically worthless unless you're trying to bump a lock. 
But it was a, a key ring. I think he has like 20 something keys on it. But he's like, yeah, here's my, here are my facility keys. I promise I'll bring yours back and I'll give you these in exchange. She's like, okay, make sure you bring them back. So uh, this is pretty funny. So we, we walked in. We had some guys that were pretty suspicious because we have uh, been there. This is our third time there and um, over the course of a few years. And so um, we knew there were some, some maintenance guys that were watching us. You know, So we go downstairs where the access control room is, and the lights are off, so there's nobody in there. And so he opens the door, and right when he opened the door, uh, one of the security, or not security, but the maintenance guys comes around the corner, and we close it really quick. And so then we run and we like jump under, we like hide under the desk and we can see the, the window right there. So we're hiding under there just waiting for this guy to come in. And I was like, Tim, what do we say if he comes in there? And he was like, uh, surprise. <laughs> you know, I was like, <laughs> and I was like, okay. So uh, fortunate for us, the guy never, never came in to look or anything. So, you know, we, we take the security guard's keys. We open the, uh, the access box for all the keys for all the company vehicles, server room. And so basically from then, you know, it could have been uh, game over. But um, and the, the reason that we're talking about this stuff again is because there's a huge issue with, as I mentioned, if there's a, a company that has a gigantic corporate building with multiple entrances, where do you see the security guards? It's usually one, maybe two, at the receptionist desk, right? So they come in, okay, here's your, uh, here's your temporary pass or whatever, and, and that's usually about it. So um, if you can distract those guys or they're not watching the monitor and paying attention, like who's, you know, other than employees, who's there, right? So it's really important to, uh, and I'll get to this in a bit, but security awareness and making that part of your culture to train the employees to say, hey, it's okay to go ask somebody a question and then that they know who to escalate that to if there's an issue. So uh, we grabbed a few other badges because we got into a room because they actually made their own employee badges there in this room. So we, uh, we got in there with the under the door tool and uh, grabbed a bunch of badges. I think we got like six or seven. A few of them were terminated employees that they hadn't disabled the badge yet. So uh, we went to a different location, and I was wearing one. It was, a, it was an Indian employee that was walking around with his badge, and still no one said anything. So, um, okay, this one, uh, this was another uh, sweet and I, I like the big buildings because there's a lot you can go after, but there's also a lot of free space. But when you are tasked with going into a single suite with a single entry and it's small and so they know everyone going in and out because they, you know, they're going to know a, a face that uh, is new. So those are quite a bit of a challenge. And so uh, another coworker and myself were... Uh, tasked with getting in this place and um, realized he went up saying uh, we found out who the vendor was that services their printers so he's a you know hey I'm here to uh, uh, pick up a tool we serviced your printer yesterday and I left a screwdriver uh, can I go grab it and she knew right away something was up so she's like I'll escort you so he walks back to the first printer he sees and looks around like oh uh Maybe it's in the truck or something. She's like, okay, and come back with me to the front door. You know, it was like he wasn't going anywhere with this. So we waited until after hours, and we uh, were like, okay, we'll just take the elevator. Well, the elevator didn't work unless you had a badge after hours. So we got into the stairway and made our way up, and they had the, uh, the Kava-style lock, where it's like the four, you know, one, two, three, four that you put in a pin code. And uh, they were like, okay, great. So... Um, People love patterns. So we started with some common patterns that we know of, and I'm, I'm writing down what we've tried. And on our 13th try, uh, it opens. So we're like, okay, that's cool. So we go in, the, in there, and it was just the cleaning crew. Of course, you know, they, they don't ask anything. Um, we were told a security guard monitors that area remote, and you're supposed to watch the monitor. 
So we're going in there, cubicles, you know, seeing passwords and stuff written on post-its, hidden underneath the keyboards. Always look underneath keyboards because people think, oh, nobody's ever going to look here. I'm going to write my password down because it's not on my screen. It's still just as, as bad, so don't do that. So um, we were finding all these passwords. We were getting into uh, picking locks and getting into sensitive files. Uh, it was financial data. So we were there for probably a good hour, hour and a half, just walking around. And so uh, we're like, okay, where's the security guard? Something's up. So we go back to the, the double glass doors, which was their, the main entrance. And uh, I had a coat hanger and I had uh, some tissues. And so there was a physical gap in the door, and they had a request to exit sensor on the other side. So, you know, if you're leaving the building, it picks up on your motion, and it will unlock the door for you. So I get this coat hanger, and I'm sitting there tying, it was like Starbucks napkins or something like that, uh, just to see, you know, what ridiculous thing can we open this door with. So I'm sitting there, and I have it tied, and I'm sticking it on the door, and the camera is right behind me, and I'm looking at the camera with this hanger going like this up and down the door with this stupid hanger with tissues tied to it. Uh, it didn't work. I think the, the angle, the degree of the sensor was too far out to pick it up. And we're like, still no one is coming. So we're like, okay, how stupid can we look now? Like, what can we do to get their attention? So we are literally doing <laughs> jumping jacks at the camera like this. And, you know, like doing stupid dance moves, which I won't. Uh, do because I can't dance and uh, they're stupid dance moves so um, the guy never came and so we reported that to the clients like you know we could have just started hauling computers out the door we could have done whatever we wanted to no one was coming it's like we literally did jumping jacks in front of the camera and no one came so um, you know there's a lot of concern because companies put so much uh, so much faith in a security guard to protect their physical security for, you know, everything. Uh, I don't understand that. I mean, I think there's the, maybe like a false sense of security, like, oh, we have security guards, we're good. Like, are you? Let me show you. Uh, so how do you fix that? I mean, there's, do you add more security guards? That's an option, probably an expensive option. But uh, you, you, train the security guards a lot of times when they come in from different companies you can have them do specific things for your company so you can you know set up different rules uh, just make sure that they are checking things like they're supposed to and that they know how to follow up so uh, on top of that security awareness training for the employees you know do something beyond just a boring PowerPoint or uh, you know where you sit down, it's like 25 minutes, you've got to do your yearly security awareness training, it takes 25 minutes and you won't remember anything you read because you just want to make sure you click the right box so that you can get back to work. That's not really very effective. Somewhat effective, but usually it's not very effective. So when we go ahead and do assessments like this, then we show them, hey, here's a real world example of what some you know, malicious attack or malicious user can do uh, with unauthorized access, but you guys are doing yearly security awareness training. Let's figure out how to switch it up, how to make it part of the culture where, you know, try to get people excited about it. And one thing I like to recommend is incentivize. So if, uh, have a, a person that regularly goes in somewhere they're not supposed to and see if a, an employee calls them out. If they do, give them a gift card or something and then give them some recognition on the next team call or something, you know, like, Hey, kudos to so-and-so for catching our, our red team guy uh, that wasn't wearing his badge and wasn't supposed to be there. And then, you know, you can hopefully try to make it something that's fun and more interactive than just a, you know, a, a click through a set a test. Um, when they just don't buy it, like I talked about earlier. So you give them the fake letter and they're like, okay, you don't work at the White House. Um, you know, this is not even a real person on this thing. Uh, you're coming with me. Like I said, just comply. And be like, okay, uh, just to let you know, I'm going to comply with what you asked me to do. Here's the real letter. Uh, can you please call the point of contact on there? 
And sometimes, you know, once the adrenaline has settled down, then they start, th- oh, maybe I should call this number. And they do. Or you say, can I please make a phone call so I can call your uh, point of contact and have them, you know, do whatever. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's both because it's like, uh, especially if it's very early on, because you're like, oh man, I you know I know I'm gonna do this, and this person gave me a dirty look, so I'm gonna make sure I get their credentials, you know, something like that, which is awful. It's not good to single anybody out, but it happens. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of disappointing because that is a really fun part of the job, but at the same time, it's exciting because hey, that's awesome. These guys are actually doing what they're supposed to do. That's why we're here in the first place. Not to embarrass anybody or make people look bad. It, we're there to help teach to improve their security posture. And so when something like that happens, you know, two things. One, hey, awesome that you're doing what you're supposed to do. Two, this is going to be a very short report that I'm going to get through quickly. So it's less paperwork, too. So uh, there's good and bad. Um, was there another? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question, and before you do that, make sure you check state laws, because that's a big thing. You can't just record someone, camera, audio, uh, you know, without their consent, and a lot of places, I know, like, uh, Pencil, places like Pennsylvania are super strict about that. Uh, so always check, and if it's a certain situation where it might be required, and the client requests it, Make sure you get it in writing and that it follows local laws and it's not just like, oh, I think someone is, you know, you don't turn into a private investigator because uh, that's a whole legal perspective you want to stay out of. So, uh, yeah, I would avoid that. We do take pictures. Now, we do take video sometimes if we're bypassing something, uh, you know, like when you do the can of the uh, compressed air upside down and you know and it goes through and it trips the the uh, request to exit sensor if we want to show that to a client or if they have a, a door so there was a security room that had uh, dimple locks that they had just put in and they had the strike plate and a few other things or, and uh, the biometric reader and they're like oh yeah you you know good luck and we're like okay so uh, I get a shove knife I think I actually might have it with me um, so this is this is one of my physical entry kits. It's just some pieces I've put together. So this little shove knife got me past like several hundred dollars worth of equipment in about five seconds because they had the physical gap that they didn't consider, uh, and the strike plate was installed incorrectly. So without you know trying to pick a dimple lock, which is awful, uh, or trying to bypass any of their readers, we just you know clicked the door open and uh, we were in. And so. Um, so, yeah, there are ways to do that. Uh, was there another hand up? Or I'm going crazy? Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, again, when they're not buying it, and you I said just come clean, comply, uh, and then eventually things will work themselves out. Um, yeah, this is off. You're going to watch it over. And, yeah, bug out, exit strategy. So... Yeah, apologies for those weak, weak stomachs. Uh, and you're going to just keep watching. You're not going to hear anything I say from the... <laughs> so, revisit the scope. So, when you're finished, uh, take some time and go back and say, okay, what were the main objectives that the client requested? Did I attempt to achieve those? If not, you know, spend some more time and go back and do what they ask. Uh, notes, anything like that. Uh, like I said, we all of the passwords and stuff that we saw on post-its, anything like that, we'll document, take pictures of, because you need something to show in the report. Um, make sure you clean up. So if, uh, if you do get into a filing cabinet and you get stuff out, or whatever it may be, make sure that when you're finished documenting, you put things back as close to possible as they were before you touched anything. If you can't, let's say you get physical access to a machine and you uh, get a reverse shell and you can't clean it up, 
make sure you document that machine and let the client know because you don't want you know the code for an interpreter shell just you know hanging around on a, on a machine. So uh, just make notes of things that you alter, anything you change, make notes uh, and let them know. Uh, and then exit the building. Um, so, and again, should you be concerned about being recorded or seen? So if it's strictly a, a covert assessment and you're, the whole point is to get in there and get out without anyone noticing you, uh, keep that in mind too. You know, pay attention where cameras are, your techniques, things like that. Um, and then is there anything else that needs to be done before you leave, as I mentioned earlier? Uh, and again, I already talked about the uh, annual training. Um, and you don't have to be paranoid all the time, you know, like someone's out to get you and, you know, steal your wallet. But maybe you do. Maybe there's a healthy level of that that's required, you know, to be diligent and to, uh, to be aware. So just stress that importance to your clients or to your customers. I'm sorry. Uh, let them know, hey, this is how easy this stuff can happen. Uh, here's what you can do. It's okay to go ask questions. So uh, we, had, we were doing a security awareness training in Washington, uh, and there was uh, one of the main guys there, as we were talking about the stuff and showing how easy it is to get in, how easy it was to get in their building, because we did this, and then we used that for their security awareness training for them to say, okay, this is why it matters. Here's an example in our building. The guy literally, literally raised his hand and said, so if I see someone that, uh, I'm not sure if they're supposed to be here. I'm just supposed to go ask them. And I was like, yeah, you go ask them. What are you doing? Who are you? Can I see your badge? Oh, I don't have a badge. Okay, well, then you need to come with me. They need to know who to call or where to take that person. So make sure that those measures are in place and just let them know that even if you're not a confrontational person, most people hate confrontation. They'll avoid it at all measure. Uh, it's still okay you know, for the sake of security to ask a question. Um, it's not, you know, most of the time you're not going to get some ridiculous response uh, from someone just from asking them a question. Um, yeah, hackers don't care how hard your network is. If they can just walk in and plug in and gain passwords, it's game over. So that's why this physical stuff is just as important. Um, Minimum baseline configurations, I'll go through this stuff real quick. Uh, do things, or can you plug in USBs or like the micro SD cards to execute payloads if someone has physical access? Uh, do you need that enabled? If not, disable it. Uh, sensitive data should always be put away. Again, don't write passwords and stuff. Uh, stick them on your desk. If you print out something from the printer, make sure you're getting it, or when you're done with things, make sure they're locked properly or shredded if no longer needed. So the, just, you know, proper uh, procedures that should be made just commonplace. Um, security vendors, like I said, you can tailor what they do. Just let them know these are our main risks. No one gets in this room. Uh, whoever is attempting to get in this room, if they don't obviously have access or they're not familiar, approach them and verify. Um, so they often make a huge difference in your physical security. And as I mentioned, they usually are the physical security program. Uh, and again, just uh, the importance has to be stressed on what their purpose is there and how much rests on their shoulders. Uh, require badges to be visible at all times. Um, employees need to understand security starts with them. You shouldn't put it all on the security guards unless you have several security guards uh, patrolling the place, if that's even in your budget. So uh, destruction and shredder bins should always be secure with a real lock, not a master lock, because you know you can look at one of those and they pop open. Um, so if it's something that is important, spend the money on a good lock. Um, and again, it doesn't matter how great your electronic controls are, if you can just bypass. Uh, so you see this here, and this is just a gate. So, yeah. 
yeah, use common sense. Uh, when you're installing these things, like the strike plate I mentioned earlier that we bypass, make sure that they're being installed properly. Uh, if your maintenance people aren't familiar with that technology, that technology, hire someone to come train them or install it for you. So, um, I mean, that's basically the talk. I went over a lot of stuff, and I think we're out of time. But uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it depends. Uh, one, we went uh, to a place, and there was a security guard. It was female, and she was sitting behind the desk, n- literally knitting a sweater, and because uh, she was bored. And so we just went and hey, how's it going? Or sometimes uh, we'll. You know, Tim likes to bring coffee, like Starbucks, if we're going early in the morning. Uh, hey guys, you know what's going on? I'm here to do this. And brought some extra coffee. Oh, thank you so much. You know, it's game over from there because of the trust and stuff. So, but yeah, it just it depends on uh, the atmosphere. It depends on the individual. So it's. Uh, but usually it comes down to basic things like know what you're talking about, uh, gain trust through you know kind conversation and getting to know the person and uh, various techniques like that. So. Oh, uh, well, there was a person using their work email credentials. It was government email for a uh, very odd adult website. And they also used that same email to sign a few petitions. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's been a few times where I've found valid credentials on help forums or um, like stored emails that are... uh, what do they call it, where you, like, backups that have been put online, so, yeah. But that's all the time I have, guys, thank you so much, and uh, come see me if you have questions, thank you.